child? Who do you take traveling? MasterCard and me. Who do you take shopping? MasterCard and me. Who do you take to dinner? MasterCard and me. And me. MasterCard and me. We can do it. Before the widespread use of credit cards, the concept of a payment card emerged with the inception of the Diners Club in 1949 by Frank McNamara and its creation marked the beginning of a novel financial system, distinct from what we now know as credit cards. The Diners Club introduced the notion of a charge card, allowing patrons to dine at restaurants on credit, with payments expected to be settled at the end of each month. Despite its unique nature, the Diners Club thrived and set the stage for subsequent financial innovations. Years later, a few fintech companies and traditional entities like American Express, particularly with their platinum and gold cards, continue the charge card tradition. Unlike credit cards, where paying the minimum can lead to significant debt and interest accumulation, charge cards emphasize full payment. Nearly 25 years ago, Diners Club introduced the first executive credit card. Today, around the world, Diners Club is still the first card. The Diners' popularity is evident from its 1959 milestone, boasting over a million members within a decade of its inception. McNamara's innovation with the Diners Club and the subsequent evolution into credit cards tapped into a fundamental aspect of human behavior disconnecting the emotional pleasure of purchase from financial responsibility. It's an intricate but potent psychological shift, where using credit cards can make individuals feel they're receiving something for free, despite understanding the financial reality. Unfortunately, the disconnection between pleasure and financial responsibility has been exploited throughout history. The allure of debt has empowered powerful entities, particularly in the banking sector, to establish dominance. The ability to lend money at an interest rate, creating a cycle of debt for its customers, has historically fueled significant financial conglomerates. It's a process devoid of conventional production. Instead, it relies on leveraging the work of debt slaves to repay loans, sustaining the wealth of the lenders. The holiday season is a time of gift giving and lots of merriment, but also a time when a lot of us get into some serious credit card trouble. The aim is to ensnare individuals, either through massive loans like mortgages, locking them into lifelong debt, or by burdening them with exorbitant interest rates. This financial entrapment disproportionately affects the less affluent, making it particularly easy for credit cards to become the perfect tool. They employ psychological tactics akin to those used in securing substantial loans like mortgages, but for everyday purchases. The innocuous appearance of a credit card, just a small piece of plastic, masks its potential for manipulation. It's tempting, a single purchase beyond current means with the intention to pay it off promptly. However, this often spirals into a situation where individuals accumulate significant credit card debt struggling to manage even the monthly interest payments. This cycle has manifested in today's statistics, where on average, an American adult holds three credit cards, each carrying an average balance exceeding $6,000. Meanwhile, credit card companies amassed a staggering $164 billion in fees and interest alone back in 2022. This evolution has effectively transformed credit cards into the modern-day equivalent of loan sharks, perpetuating financial traps for countless individuals. Despite this dark reality, my parents and I are actually advocates for credit cards. We have a total of nine credit cards and have never paid a single cent in interest to these companies. The key lies in prudent financial habits, never purchasing beyond one's means, and consistently paying off the card balance each month. By doing so, one can enjoy the benefits and rewards that these credit cards offer without falling victim to their pitfalls. Money for unexpected things. And money for those times when cash, and only cash will do, 
Bank AmeriCard. It's money in a more versatile form. Bank of America introduced a groundbreaking concept with its Bank AmeriCard, the first widely usable credit card in the late 1950s, as they dropped about 60,000 of them to people. Initially, it granted instant credit access to individuals across various parts of the world, transforming their spending habits from America, across Europe, and to Asia. However, due to its rudimentary design of not having the magnetic strip, just like the ones we have today, which functions as a purchase tracker, the bank faced substantial losses. Credit card fraud was rampant in those early days, causing Bank of America to suffer financial setbacks despite amassing a considerable customer base. Despite these setbacks, the concept gained traction, leading to the birth of Visa through a merger in the 1970s, thus initiating fierce competition among credit card providers. The introduction of magnetic strips in the 1980s marked a turning point, allowing more banks to show off their credit cards. This accessibility triggered a surge in household debt in the United States. Well, U.S. household debt increased by 2% in the second quarter, topping over $16 trillion. That's according to the New York Federal Reserve Bank. While banks were making modest profits from the 4 to 5% interest rates, eventually they sought ways to maximize their earnings. The breakout came in the late 1980s and early 1990s when South Dakota, facing severe financial strain, removed its cap on credit interest rates. This move became a watershed moment, enabling credit card companies to increase rates substantially. Consumer advocates say the problem is, is that for the last 30 years, banks have been allowed to set up shop in states that permit sky-high interest rates or have no limits on fees. Banks, in turn, charge their customers in other states whatever they want. Subsequently, the U.S. Supreme Court's Marquette decision permitted banks to export these high rates to other states, amplifying their revenue potential. This legal maneuvering effectively transformed credit cards from a tool of convenience to a lucrative mechanism for imposing exorbitant interest rates on customers. The banks had found a way to leverage the psychology of buying for free associated with credit cards into a system that ensnared individuals into long-term, high-interest debt cycles. As the interest rate cap is removed from other states, this led to an influx of credit card offers extended to a wide spectrum of individuals, from college students to even the unemployed. However, those deemed riskier were subjected to exorbitant interest rates, often resulting in lifelong debt entrapment. Citibank emerged as one of the most profitable businesses in the early 2000s, propelled by the Supreme Court's decision called Smiley, which eliminated the last bit of regulation on late fees and interest rates. This decision granted banks unprecedented freedom to impose exorbitant changes, resulting in sky-high interest rates of up to 36%. The credit card companies capitalized further by enticing individuals with lucrative offers like cashback incentives and no annual fees. By the 2000s, credit card usage had doubled, even among low-income households. Targeting young, financially inexperienced college students became a strategic move. Most students sought extra cash without comprehending the fine print, making them susceptible to missed payments and subsequent penalties, a ticket to lifelong debt. According to the New York Federal Reserve, consumer credit card debt in the U.S. fluctuated between about $700 billion and $900 billion for the last two decades. Well, not anymore. This last quarter, credit card debt surpassed $1 trillion. That's a 16% growth from a year ago. Interestingly, if the borrower manages to pay off the debt without occurring any interest every single month, they would be categorized as bad customers, since the credit card company would not be able to profit a single dime from them. Hence, their favorite type of customers would be those who carried a balance and paid interest monthly. Credit card companies strategically targeted individuals who struggled to repay debts, aiming for 
revolvers, those who were unable to settle their debts, leading to escalating balances. American credit card companies adopted practices reminiscent of high-end loan sharks. They employed teams of lawyers to craft complex contracts loaded with loopholes buried within the fine print. These loopholes granted them broad powers, including the ability to hike interest rates for missing payments on unrelated loans, setting due dates on public holidays or weekends to increase the likelihood of late payments, and promoting paperless transactions, since they know that most individuals won't even bother to check their emails. And as with new credit card laws in effect these days, consumers are more protected. But there are still some loopholes that will leave you vulnerable. Is that the end of the story? Well, hardly. A new report claims that credit card issuers are finding a back door into college campuses. The Washington Post says since banks can no longer make credit card pitches directly to students, they're instead offering them debit card. And here's the catch. These cards tie into their student loans. To lure in more customers, credit card companies offered enticing rewards, cashback incentives, and the introduction of 0% fees for initial months. Conditioning users to be habitually late on payments without experiencing immediate interest charges. They even lowered minimum payments to encourage prolonged debt. This resulted in the average American owing over $8,000 in credit card debt, predominantly accruing penalties for late payments. Even after declaring bankruptcy, these individuals continued to receive tempting offers from numerous credit card companies, perpetuating the cycle of debt accumulation. The most effective strategy to shield oneself from credit card pitfalls is simple. Firstly, refrain from purchasing what exceeds your financial means. If you wouldn't spend your own cash on an item, avoid using a credit card for it. Secondly, commit to clearing the balance each month no matter what. By adhering to these two principles, you can sidestep from paying any interest or fees to credit card companies. To me, credit cards resemble a double-edged sword. Much like fire or a vehicle, when mishandled, they can ignite financial trouble, akin to the destructive nature of fire in the wrong hands. Yet when wielded prudently, fire can be a source of warmth and light, just as a vehicle can provide mobility and convenience. Responsible usage of credit cards mirrors this. It offers financial convenience and rewards. However, for those who struggle to manage it, avoiding it may be the wisest choice.